Okay, I'm just waiting for everyone to connect, uh, but it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to the next session um, of Creativity from Vienna to the World. Um, the topic of today's session is cultural transfer, and we'll have two wonderful speakers who I'll introduce uh, each for their talk. Um, and after the two talks, then we can go into an open discussion. So our first uh, speaker today is my wonderful co-organizer for the event, uh, Megan Brando Faller, uh, who is professor of history at the City University of New York, Kingsborough, and she also teaches at the Cooney Graduate Center. Her research focuses on art and design in secessionist and interwar Vienna, including children's art and artistic toys of the Vienna secession, expressionist ceramics of the Wiener Werkstätte, folk art and modernism, and women's art education. She is the co-editor of Childhood by Design, Toys and the Material Culture of Childhood from 1700 to the Present, which came out with Bloomsbury in 2018, and the author of The Female Secession, Art and the Decorative at the Viennese Women's Academy, published by Penn State University Press in 2020. And uh, most recently, she is also co-editor with Laura Morowitz of Erasures and Eradications in Modern Viennese Art, Architecture and Design, which came out with Routledge in 2022. Megan con contributed two catalog essays for the retrospective exhibition Die Frauen der Wiener Werkstätte, um, The Women of the Wiener Werkstätte at, Wien at Vienna's Museum of Applied Arts in 2021. And her newest project focuses on the dissemination and popularization of secessionist ideas of child creativity in post-war America. And her paper today is titled From Secessionist Vienna to Post-War America, Emmy Zweibrück, Franz Cizek, and the Cult of Child Creativity. Megan, thank you. Yours. thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you to our program assistants and to everybody joining us. So I'll just go ahead uh, with the screen share and get us uh, started. Okay, perfect. So our presentations today are relatively brief um, to leave time for Q and A, so about 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, so the cult, the cult of child creativity taking root in post-war America is the notion that all children are inherently creative with unique access to imaginative powers. Today, this notion remains ubiquitous in contemporary American society as manifested in our elementary and preschool curricula in a pervasive DIY culture for artistic practice in the home and in a multi-billion dollar art supply industry. But very rarely is this uh, discourse on child creativity, which was so important to the post-war um, political cultural consciousness, very rarely are these discourses connected to their intellectual roots in secessionist Vienna. Based in Vienna until after the Anschluss, Emmy Zweibrück was a preeminent um, art educator, pedagogue, and craftswoman who possessed a preeminent international reputation primarily as an art educator associated with the methods of free expression linked to Klimt Group member Franz Cizek. She published widely on contemporary handcraft and ran an applied arts workshop that specialized in textiles, embroidery, toys, and book illustration, which was a venture she ran in tandem with her progressive craft school for girls that opened in 1915. Now famously, she cultivated in her workshops and school a design language inspired largely by folk art and children's drawings. Attracting the attention of American visitors, Zweibrück offered regular lecture tours and seminars throughout the United States, um, especially beginning in the mid-1930s. Publications like The Stencil Book and Hands at Work encouraged teachers to free the spark of creative genius slumbering in every child, words and phrases that seem to echo uh, the teachings of Chizek. She also spread these ideas through her work as art. American Crayon Company, a position that she held from 1939 until her death in 1956, and especially through her editorship of the American Crayon Company's promotional journal, Everyday Art, 
shown here uh, on this side. So renowned was Zweibrug's international reputation as a craftswoman, designer, and pedagogue that she was honored with a retrospective exhibition at the Vienna Secession in summer 1955, which was curated by her friend and associate Josef Hofmann. So while Zweibrug is often compared to familiar male touchstones like Chizek or uh, Hofmann, it is my argument that she was unique in her roles in marketing and commodifying child creativity and modernist design and bringing these to a popular post-war American audience. Interwoven with subtle product endorsements for American crayon company project, products, she penned meticulous step-by-step -step instructions um, for projects that was penned in a buoyant, sunshiny style that was in, intended to encourage amateur makers to create things ranging from handmade table linens to wall hangings to greeting cards. Reader, readers were greeted with inviting headings like you can do cross stitch embroidery or stenciling is easy to do. Such instructional pros beg the question of whether hobby is truly intended to undertake her complex projects or merely lived vicariously through a fiction of self-directed improvement and perfectionism, not unlike what critics have observed apropos the contemporary Martha Stewart phenomenon. So Zweibrück's post-war American legacy was rooted in developments in interwar and secessionist Vienna. Interwar Vienna in particular was widely likened to a mecca of progressive art education. Droves of English and American, um, especially, art teachers, um, critics, and artists flooded the city to witness firsthand the progressive me methods of Chizek, Zweibrück, and others. The Anglo-American influence of Franz Chizek was anchored through the English language um, translation, which came out in 1927, of his popular manual on paper cutting, and also a series of booklets penned by English relief workers like Francesca Wilson. Also securing Chizek's American fame was the famous traveling exhibition of the Chizek School, which originated at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and traveled through a variety of important venues, um, such as the San Francisco Legion of Honor. The Chizek exhibition first, before coming to America, toured through England from 1921 to 1923, and Chizek's American exhibition catapulted him to international fame to the extent that he remembered Amer an American quote unquote great migration and how attending students in his classes were often dwarfed by American visitors three to one. Now I can say this is definitely attested to by the droves of international visitors that signed his guest book to witness firsthand his, his courses. Um, the, the number of international visitors was especially strong in the summers um, when art teachers, especially crowds of 30, 40, even upwards of 80, packed in to witness the classes. First rediscovered in the seminal 1985 Wien Museum retrospective, Chizek's uh, reputation as a progressive pedagogue now stands um, preeminent in the annals of Viennese artistic and cultural history. And we're delighted to have as one of our speakers in the weeks to come, um, the co-curator of this exhibition speaking. In his famous youth art classes, Chizek shunned conventional methods of art instruction that privileged skill and technical accuracy. Seeking to unlock the inborn creative drives he believed resided in every child, um, ideas that Zweibrook brought commercially to the promotion of American Crayon Company products. Chizek encouraged pupils to release inner experiences through free choice of handcraft media. A critical part of his teaching was his notion that children should be sheltered from the conventions of adult art, what he viewed as the corrupting influence of books, museums, and journals. In Chizek's classroom, children were left to supposedly teach themselves uninfluenced by the teacher. The aim of the course was patently non-vocational, 
there was not a specific career um, trajectory. Rather, it was to broadly nourish children's creativity. And the courses were popular among um, the patrons of, of Klimt and the Wiener Werkstätte. So Chizik's younger counterpart, Emmy Zweibrook, has often been understood, and I would argue um, incorrectly, in the shadow of more famous male contemporaries like Chizek or Hoffmann. Zweibrook so shared with Chizek common emphases on expressing feelings, thoughts, and emotions through free choice of handcraft media and permissive instructional methods. As writer Georg von Terramare encapsulated her school's philosophies, quote, children create freely from within themselves and should give thoughts and feelings personal expression, recording in a variety of media, end quote. Swybrook likewise de-emphasized traditional uh, teaching methods in favor of students' direct experimentation in handcraft materials, foregoing pre preliminary drafting on paper. As she held in her best-selling DIY craft manual, Hands at Work, which she published with the American Crayon Company in 1946, quote, everybody who works with color should experiment with his materials like, like a violinist uses his bow. Like Chizek, who disdained copying from nature, Zweibruch em emphasized that applied design was, quote, not simply a copy of nature, end quote, but should capture the rhythm or feeling of an object in an abstracted, symbolic way. In particular, both children and adult amateurs were to find inspiration in the quote unquote primitive and simultaneously modernist visual qualities of folk art when decorating the world around them. As she instructed readers of the stencil book, quote, like those peasant motifs, our design should represent objects stripped of all accessory details in a simplified manner, end quote. Swybook's lifelong interest in folk art reveals another point of overlap and departure from Chizek, and that is the positive conflation of untrained children's art with the art of so-called primitive peoples from, from tribal folk cultures and the potential of both categories as rejuvenating sources for contemporary art and design. An apt illustration of the artist's lifelong engagement with folk art can be found in her 1934 picture book um, in English, The Toy Cupboard, which was a collaboration with German art historian Edwin Redslow. Much like the cover image, which featured a simply constructed horse and carriage toy, the book paired innovative verse with color woodblock prints that were executed in an electric palette of yellows, pinks, and blues. While Chizek sublimated his painting career to teaching, Zweibruch's pro prolific work in industrial and applied design was animated by her sustained engagement with folk art, which she collected and displayed in her school, as shown here. So I book in her American years readily admitted how her initial fascination with European folk art, including toys, painted furniture, and religious objects, gave way to a freer style that was informed by Native American and Mexican objects after her immigration with uh, after her immigration to America. But Zweibruch's attitudes towards primitivism were more complicated than Chizek's in extending her appreciation of outsider art to the art of untrained amateurs. Zweibruch valorized the lack of formal training among adult hobbyists and summoned them to harness their unspoiled freshness, much like the simplicity and naivete of folk artists. As she advised, quote, People who are without art training should not be afraid of drawing because most of their time, their motives are even stronger and have more charm because they do not try to imitate nature. So unlike Chizek, much of Zweibruch's career was dedicated to teaching adult um, amateurs, especially after her immigration. And I would argue was a particularly uh, bold move um, for a professionally trained woman artist, given the ways that the specter of dilettantism 
haunted their artistic ambitions. So while Chizek taught male and female students aged four to 14, Sveibruck School was only open to girls and possessed three divisions. So first, uh, seasonal courses for very young children. Second, a general division for girls not intending to pursue art as a vocation. And finally, uh, third, a separate division for high school age pupils that focused on professional handcraft training in preparation for guild examinations. So in the latter regard, uh, she never rejected vocational training in the wholesale way that Chizek did. As Teramari observed, I'm, I'm a minority of quote, truly artistically gifted and talented pupils were recruited for the Zweigruck workshops, which specialized in embroidery, textiles, toy making and book made, making, where they found encouragement and stimulation through commissions, competitions, and the biannual school exhibitions that were open to all students. Such linkages between school and workshop paralleled in many ways the close institutional linkages between the secession, uh, Wiener Werkstätte or Vienna workshops, and um, secessionist dominated School of Applied Arts. Yet the Zweibruck workshops were distinct from the Wiener Werkstätte in representing a distinctly female form of entrepreneurship. The firm was led by women, it was staffed by female school graduates, and importantly focused on um, matrilineal forms of artistic transmission and historically um, female um, media and techniques like textiles and embroidery. So as much as she is celebrated for studies like, for her studies with um, secessionists like um, Moser and Chizek, equally formative was her training in the School of Applied Arts textile workshops under uh, Rosalie Rotanzul. She was part of a new generation of female instructors that was hired as part of the institution's secessionist reforms. Informed by the primitivizing currents of folk and children's art, um, Zweibruck embroidery possessed, according to curator Paul Klobuchar, quote, a hot-blooded sense of color bordering on the Slavic and was found to advance futuristic, cubistic, and expressionistic orgies of color. Like those shown at the 1925 Decorative Arts Exposition in Paris, the artist's lace designs integrated cubist spatial principles in the deliberately schematized, flattened treatment of floral and architectural motifs. In her teaching, Zweibruck's popular instructional columns stressed an exacting precision in technique and in some ways countered the very spontaneity that educators like Chizek prized. In outlining methods for hand printed greeting cards, for instance, the pedagogue underlined careful planning and that quote, nothing should be a mere accident. We should fully take responsibility for every line used, end quote. Stenciling was one of the artist's most favored techniques in the modernist simplicity, um, in the modernist formal simplicity the technique engendered. Um, and here you can see here a commercial kit that she devised and put out for the American Crayon um, Company in the early 1940s. But stenciling, according to Zweibruck, demanded crisp perfection. Cutting pens were to be used on glass or hard surfaces to, quote, produce absolutely sharp outlines. Clean corners were favored, while jagged corners were to be avoided at all, at all costs. Interwoven with subtle product endorsements for American crayon company uh, products, like only use easy cut uh, transparent stencil uh, paper, she penned her meticulous step-by-step -step instructions in a buoyant, sunshiny style that was intended to encourage amateur craftswomen to create all of her projects, handmade table linens, wall hangings, greeting cards, crushes, with ease. Readers were greeted with inviting headings like stenciling is easy to do. 
But quite likely, such welcoming headings and catchphrases belied a mixture of anxiety and confidence in that her meticulous instructions might have engendered in real readers feelings of ambivalence that were typical of those um, produced by domestic advice magazines. Historically, women's advice magazines simultaneously fostered feelings of anxiety and insufficiency as much as they offered encouragement. Zweibrook's popular manuals were sold as part of the American Crayon Company's Everyday Art series and begged the question of whether amateur hobbyists truly intended to undertake these complex projects like the detailed instructions for jigsaw figures to be used for making crushes, or whether they merely whether they merely lived vicariously through a fiction of self-directed improvement and perfectionism. These are qualities that remain hallmarks of DIY literature today. Perhaps the appeal of her manuals and instructional prose lay less in the reality of making, but as a liminal space of self-transformation and self-directed perfectionism that connected amateur makers to a broader community not unlike the contemporary DIY culture or even the Martha, Mar Martha Stewart phenomenon, what some commentators have likened to looking through the world through Martha Stewart's perfect glass windows. Importantly, uh, Zweibruck edited the um, American Crayon Company's promotional journal, Everyday Art, from 1953 to 1956, although she had a large hand in it beforehand as well. Um, she was artistic director of the company from 1939 to 1956. Under her editorship, the journal's pedagogical and artistic aspects came to the fore, while its commercial character receded into the background. Readers, she explained she wanted to elevate the journal, broaden the reader's insight into all forms of art and challenge him to new critical views. Uh, she illustrated in the journal the new Pacific Coast headquarters she had commissioned for the American Crayon Company by the architect uh, Richard Neutsch, uh, and also uh, changed the overall look of the journal. Newly instituted subscription fees allowed promotional content to recede to the front and back covers, while defraying cost of the higher quality paper, lavish layouts, layouts, and full color illustrations that were typical of leading design journals. So here you can see a glimpse of everyday art under her editorship and what it looked like um, before it. Um, was much more blatant in its adver advertising and had the look of a sort of trade journal. Unsurprisingly, several issues under her editorship were, de de were devoted to progressive developments in children's art education. The fall 1953 issue featured texts by Viennese critics like Leopold Rokovansky on the Chizik School and featured an etching um, birthday party from her own daughter Nora's studies with Chizek. The issue rehearsed the standard narrative on Chizek as an underappreciated genius. His reforms were initially scorned at home, but later found widespread acceptance as the basis for, quote, our modern attitude towards education. As such, as a whole, the issue sold a clear, if subliminal message to readers, they too, by purchasing commercial, commercial products from the American Crayon Company, could buy into the cult of the creative child that was born in secessionist Vienna. So despite her renown in her own lifetime, the reputation of Zweibuk has languished in comparison to that of Chizik. Perhaps it is because it is difficult to historicize the legacy of an artist whose legacy remains intangible through her work as a teacher of children and amateurs. Perhaps it is because her legacy remains bound up in gendered hierarchies of media, material, and technique that still guide conventional art historical narratives today. 
Indeed, for serious art historians, perhaps it is still uncomfortable to fathom that um, children's books, like the toy covered, could be the nexus of avant-garde artistic developments. Um, in our talks, podcasts, and blog posts, we hope with cre creativity from Vienna to the world to contribute to rethinking these hierarchies and valorizing the transmission of historically feminine artistic practices, media, and modes of information. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this great talk, Megan. I'm sure there's going to be many, many questions um, to follow. Um, for now, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, um, who is anne katrin Rosberg, um, the head of the Metal Collection and the Wiener Werkstätte Archive at Vienna's Museum of Applied Arts, the MAC. In 2021, she curated the MAC exhibition, Women Artists of the Wiener Werkstätte. She is also the scientific director of the Anton Feistauer Forum in Maishofen, Pinskau, um, and has taught at the University of Vienna, as well as at the University of the Applied Arts in Vienna. For many years, she's also worked with the artist group Gelatine. Gelatin. Um, anne katrin Rosberg um, has published widely on the history of interiors and furniture, especially gender-specific rooms, on commercial art from the Max Works and Paper Collection, and on various Wiener Werkstätte topics. Most recently, she has co-edited the publication Gestalterinnen, uh, Frauen, Design und, Gesell und Gesellschaft, so... Um, I can't really translate Gestalterinnen on the, on the spot, uh, creators, let's say, uh, Women, Design um, and Society, um, which is co-edited together with Elana Shapira um, and forthcoming in the summer uh, 2023, so this year. And her talk uh, today is titled Feliz Rix Ueno at the MoMA, American Documentation of the Cultural Transfer Between Vienna and Japan. Um, okay, thank you very much, Julia, <laughs> uh, for the nice introduction, and thank you both, Megan and Julia, for the invitation to this lecture series, which give me, um, gives me the opportunity to speak about one of the most interesting women artists of the Wiener Werkstätte, it's um, Felis Rix Ueno, and I will share my screen. Okay. So, yeah, um, Felis Rix Ueno is uh, hardly known in her native city, Vienna, but all the more so in her adopted home, Japan. And I would like to show that her style was very independent and distinctive right from the start, drawing inspiration from Asian art even before she met her Japanese husband, Isaburo Ueno, in 1924, and later moved to Kyoto with him. Uh, do you see my, uh, oh, I cannot move? Uh, yes, we can see your presentation, but we see yeah. the presentation mode. We see both images. Oh, ah, okay. Can you, can you restart the presentation or, yeah? Uh, okay. Um, do you see it now? Yes, yes. Um, um, when you start the presentation, it should oh? be okay. Yes, now it's perfect. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, okay, I start again. Um, Felis Rix um, was strongly represented in the exhibition of the women artists of the Wiener Werkstätte shown at the MAC two years ago and was particularly highlighted as one of the Fab Four alongside Mathilde Flögel, Maria Likatz and Wally Wieseltier. Here I um, show an insight into the exhibition which was designed by the architect Claudia Kavala. At the back, you will notice um, a large tableau with uh, Rick's fabrics. And on the very left side, 
uh, a series of fashion designs made from her fabrics. Very elegantly, Claudia Kavala staged the beautiful leather cigarette boxes, as you can see on the smaller, uh, smaller photo. The show was intended to advance the research into the work of the individual artists and subsequently present their oeuvre in solo exhibitions. Dialogue from 2018, which she edited, Designing Transformation from 2021, uh, and the anthology with Daniel. Sorry, I, I hear some, somebody else. <laughs> Um, Felis Rix is the first Wiener Werkstätte woman artist to whom the MAC is dedicating such a solo exhibition. It will be opened at the end of November this year, so please save the date. Um, last year, the National Museum of Modern Art Kyoto held a major exhibition on Felis Rix, not the first, by the way, there was already one in 2009. Another stop of this show was the Mitsubishi Ishigokan Museum in Tokyo. The show was accompanied by an extensive catalog and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the curator, Yuko Ikeda, who provided me with some uh, visual material for this lecture. The symposium examines the exchange between Central Europe and the, the United States using the example of various female designers whose career started in Vienna. In the case of Phyllis Rix, whose biography has only few points to contact with the USA, my remarks take the title From Vienna to the World as an opportunity to examine Rick's relationship with East Asia. However, in order to establish a connection to the United States, I have chosen the famous international exhibition Modern Architecture as a starting point. It took place in 1932 at the MoMA in New York, and a work uh, jointly done by Isaburo Ueno and Felix Rix Ueno was shown here, the so-called uh, Staba in Kyoto, designed in 1930 and executed, realized in uh, 1931. In the exhibition catalog, uh, only Isaburo was mentioned, as you can see here on the right side on the list. The text, written by the initiators and organizers of the show, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson, reads as follows. I quote, um, in Japan, the publication of books and magazines has propagandized modern architecture. Yamada and Ueno are the best known younger art architects. Uh, end of quotation. It can be assumed that the star bar was presented with the help of the magazines mentioned. On the left is an illustration from the Japanese magazine International Architecture. On the right, a draft shows the colorfulness of the room and, like the photo, a decisive design feature, the murals. Figurative painting as an architectural design tool played a subordinate role in modernism. The walls were white or monochrome. It is all the more interesting that Henry Russell Hitchcock, in his publication The International Style, Architecture since 1922, which accompanied the exhibition, describes figurative painting as a perfectly legitimate means of decorating walls. However, it's very important that it is of, I quote, excellent quality. Apparently, the murals in the star bar satisfied the demands of the exhibition curators Hitchcock and Johnston because they were of excellent quality. This was guaranteed by Felix Rix Ureno, Ueno, who designed and probably also executed the paintings. It is therefore regrettable that she remained unmentioned in the MoMA exhibition. The subject of architecture was still male dominated and in modern architecture, women did not even appear as interior designers, at least not in the context of this exhibition. Felix Rix had already gained experience in wall and ceiling designs in Vienna. 
In 1918, the Wiener Werkstätte set up a new branch for fabrics and lace at Kärntnerstraße 32. Eight women artists were responsible, responsible for the decorative designs of the premises, including Lotte Kalm, Hilda Jesser, Fritzi Löw, and Wally Wieseltier. Felix Rix designed the ceiling of the ribbon and lace sales room. Already here, she shows motifs that were to appear again and again in later stages of her career, also in the star bar. Birds with opulent head and tail feathers, as well as grasses and flower stands. The delicate paintings testify a highly poetic approach gained from her study of Asian art and corresponded congenially to the products presented in this room, rays and ribbons. While it is sometimes difficult to attribute the murals to the other artists, Rix has already formed her distinctive signature and is therefore unmistakable. Um, at this point, I would like to briefly focus on Felix Rix's biography, her education and her career. She was born on the first June of uh, the first of June in 1893 in Vienna, and grew up in the second district in a house on Praterstraße, which is the main boulevard in Vienna. So we can celebrate her 113th birthday this year. Her father, uh, Julius Rix, worked for the Wiener Werkstätte in various positions until his death in 1927. And her youngest sister, Kitty, worked in the VV Ceramics Department from 1924. Two other sisters were also active in artistic professions. Felice studied at the school, uh, school of Applied Arts from 1913. First textile with uh, Rosalia Rothansel, then architecture with uh, Josef Hoffmann, as well as ornamental form theory with Franz uh, Cisek sculpture with Anton Hanak and enamel art with Adele von Stark. At school, she met her later Wiener Werkstätte colleagues like uh, Jesse, Kalm and Löw, you see here, all of them uh, uh, in a photograph around 1916. Already during her studies, she designed glass and fabric decors for the Wiener Werkstätte. It was common for Hoffmann to involve his students and later graduates in the work for the VV. At the beginning of 1915, the so-called war glasses were created, executed by Johann Oertel in Bohemia. Hoffmann determined the shapes of the glasses. The decorations came from various artists. Uh, Mathilde Flögel and Fritzi Löw, for example, choose narrative motives and created scenes with soldiers. Rick, uh, Rix, on the other hand, developed a very restrained geometric design. It was limited to the dates, 1914-1915, and the black and yellow color scheme of the dual monarchy. Similarly, a strict and at the same time subtle are uh, her early fabric patterns such as Archibald, a classic design that was used for a long time. Um, how did Felice Rix find her style? What were the influences? We know about the great importance that the Biedermeier style of the early 19th century had on the designs of Austrian modernism of the early 20th century. And we know also about the importance of the Japanese art, whose surface style was so inspiring for Hoffmann, Kuhlmann, Moser, Gustav Klimt, and also Dagobert Teche. Dealing with uh, these role models was part of the lessons at the School of Applied Arts and could be deepened by investigating the collection of the Austrian Museum of Art and Industry, which is today's MUC. The school and the museum were originally a joint institution and were in lively exchange. Felix Rix may have, been, uh, may have seen fabric sample boards from the Viennese silk factory from 1830 in the museum, and she certainly studied the many katagami, the dyeing stencils, which had been in the collection since 1907. 
You can see here again the fabric pattern Archibald, Archibald, together with a similar pattern called Sagans, like the little town in Switzerland, and the design Schweden, Sweden, in comparison to the possible models. And further examples of uh, Katagami and, and Rick's fabrics show, on the one hand, the inspiration, and on the other hand, the reinterpretation of the models by the artist. This is particularly clear in the second example from the left, in the uh, purple, purple carnation fabric. Um, you can see here the half or full unfolded fans of the dying stencil become blossoms of the same kind. The pattern is therefore adapted to the Western market in terms of motif. Um, the influence of Japanese art is evident not only in the pattern designs, but also in the pictorial representations. The portfolio Mode Wien Fashion Vienna brought together several Wiener Werkstätte artists in 1914-15 and is an homage to the famous ukiyo-e, the Japanese color woodcuts. woodcuts. Um, they, here they are uh, lion cuts uh, uh, on Japanese paper. In her prints, Rix um, also shows the use of Japanese stylistic devices as in the winter scene on the left. Little space and depth, but plenty of space around the motifs, which are often grouped together. At the same time, she finds a very modern language by means of strong abstraction. The trees are only indicated schematically, and the houses in the background are closer to a New York scene than to Vienna's Ringstraße. Another example of Felix Rick's Japonism, before she met her husband and moved to Japan, are fabrics uh, that are linked to the country in terms of motive or title. She calls a fabric designed from 1923 Japan land, Japan country, but also incorporates other Asian influences here. The spaceless decking of figures, plants, mountains, and uh, rivers is more reminiscent of Chinese wallpapers like the one that has survived in our collection. Yoshiko Asami in the catalog of the last year's exhibition in Kyoto refers uh, to the figure in a rickshaw-like vehicle that looks more like a Chinese or Vietnamese person and concludes, I quote, to Japanese eyes, VV textile Japan land looks to be full of misrepresentations. End of quotation. Here, Rix has formed her own view of a country she did not know yet. A country that had to experience a severe earthquake in 1923. So the fabric design was possibly created under the impression of this event. One year later, Felice Rix met the architect Isaburo Ueno, who after a study visit to Berlin, worked in Josef Hoffmann's architectural office from August, 1924. In this year, she creates the fabric pattern Tokyo, possibly already as a reaction to this acquaintance. It's very beautiful, but has neither a motive nor a design reference to the place. Maria Lickertz later designed a dress made of Shantung silk with the Tokyo pattern. Two photos of Felice and Isaburo show how they both got involved with foreign culture in terms of fashion. In the photo on the left, the couple can be seen on the steamship Unterwalden, which still sails on Lake Lucerne in Switzerland. Isaburo is wearing traditional mountaineering clothes, knickerbockers, woolen stockings and mountain boots, while Felice is dressed in an urban costume. It is possible that they were in Switzerland on their honeymoon and the Sargans fabric I mentioned before may be a reference to this event. 
Conversely, in the second picture taken in Kyoto, Felice is seen in a tra traditional Japanese kimono and Isaburo in an urban suit. Um, Felice Rix had already made contact with the kimono type of garment during her time in Vienna, although not in this classical form. In Western fashion of the interwar period, this garment enjoyed great popularity as, as a kind of dressing gown. On the left, you see a kimono designed by Maria Likatz, made of the Rix uh, fabric Purpurnelke, Purple Carnation, from the time when Likatz was head of the fashion department of the Wiener Werkstätte. And on the right, a dressing gown made of Rix fantastic fabric Donnerwetter thunderstorm created around 1920. The Japanism of the Wiener Moderne, the Viennese uh, Modernism, is thus not only evident in the adoption and adaptation of motives and types of representation from the Katagami or Kyo-e, but also in the integration of classical Japanese elements into everyday Western life. The kimono in fashion is an example of this, as is the folding screen for the interior design. Koloman Moser's Paravent from 1906 is an example of dealing with the models on two levels, typological and creative. He designed a three-part folding screen covered with squares of gold paper and collages of female figures made of various marble papers. They cropped depiction in extremely tall formats follow the Japanese formal language. Likewise, the gold ground was a classical design element as the example of an 18th century Japanese screen show in the middle here. Also in Felix Rick's Paravan, the right side created around 1935, the gold color together with the dirty silver takes up the largest area. The landscape motif is grouped in the center. It's a as in Moser's work, however, the, the empty surface is enlivened by the irregular colorfulness, especially of the silver overlays and their collage-like treatment. Felix Rick Sueno moved to Kyoto with her husband in 1926 and both founded the Ueno Architectural Office. He had a, the, uh, the construction, uh, construction office and she the art and craft department. Until 1930, she visited Vienna regularly and continued to produce designs for the Wiener Werkstätte. During this time, in addition to a number of fabric patterns, and designs, she created and a series of enamel works. On the left, you can see a cassette with enamel decoration that follows the same principles as her screen shown before. A central motif is surrounded by empty space, giving it plenty of space to unfold its effect. In contrast, in a later cassette executed around 1950, the motifs are evenly distributed over the surface. And I would like to point out here the three tall, slender figures with closed outlines. They are reminiscent of turned toy figures created in Vienna in the 1920s. Rixoeno herself created such wooden figures in the 1930s following the Viennese examples. I'm showing two wooden dolls from our collection here. Um, on the right side, one possibly by Felice herself, one attributed to Emmy Zweibrück. In the case of the figure mother with child on the left side, there is a further abstraction compared to the other figures. Arms and body divisions are completely omitted. The patterns of the dresses are only hinted at. Once again, Rick's works with the clarity and sophistication of the Japanese formal language. Quite specifically, she is inspired here by the Kokeshi dolls, uh, 
that were given as gifts for the birth of a girl or for a wedding in Japan. A traditional Japanese cultural object that had not yet occupied Riggs in her Viennese period is the scroll painting. Together with Isaburo, she created horizontal scroll paintings from 1940 onwards. He wrote the texts and she did the illustrations. They are depictions from Manchuria where Isaburo was stationed as a civil engineer during the Second Sino-Japanese War. A highly interesting example is a scroll painting designed only by Felice, on which she, she spreads out the wide range of the Christkindlmarkt series in Vienna. Its colorful stalls, the Maroni Prater, and the sale of the fir trees. It is a reminiscence of her childhood and youth, and the narrative is accordingly designed in a rather naive formal language. Here, both cultures collide directly. The Japanese art format serves a popular Austrian theme and enables the artist to tell an endless story. Rixoeno's approach to Japanese art is thus a multifaceted one. She transformed the patterns of katagami or the pictorial language of ukiyo-e into her own language. In the doors, forms of Austrian folk culture merge with Japanese kokeshi figures. And in the Christkindle scroll painting, on the other hand, form and content serve each other but remain independent. Finally, I would like to come back to the star bar from 1931. Felice Riggs repeatedly recurs to motifs that she has already used and then develop them further, also uh, for other contexts. The birth of the ceiling of the Wiener Werkstätte sales room at Kärntnerstrasse 32 return in the wallpaper collection that was produced in 1928 by the Swiss company Salubra AG on behalf of the Wiener Werkstätte. They appear in modified form in the draft for an enamel painting as well as in a wall motif for the star bar. The self-citation was common practice at the Wiener Werkstätte and was exemplified by Josef Hoffmann. He varied certain motifs in all dimensions and functional contexts from the silver box um, to the building, the architecture. The attraction uh, lies in the different effects of what is actually always the same. Felice Rix Oeno remains true to herself throughout her life. She has a wide range of design options, but with a strong recognition effect. The basis for her style is her engagement with Japanese art during her training at the School of Applied Arts. She, she took her Japanese uh, to Kyoto and continued it there. In the later room designs, one gets the impression that Riggs became more generous and powerful in her style. Nevertheless, that didn't exclude the subtle and the refined. One of her last works in this field was the actress restaurant, which was uh, located in the Nisai Theater in Tokyo. From 1963, the designs were created and carried out with the help of her students. In addition to her work as a designer, a large part of her activity after the Second World War was teaching. In 1950, she was invited to lead the color and composition classes at the Kyoto City College of Fine Art, where her husband was already working. After retiring in 1963, she founded the International Design Institute with Isaburo and taught there until her death in 1967. There's a little but revealing information about her teaching. such as that on paper. 
I quote, creating images using colored paper instead of brush made the results less realistic than in painting, teaching us to express ourselves more boldly in broader colors and shapes, which was the aim of the course, end of quotation. He also describes um, that Felix Riggs refused to show the students her work in order not to influence them. They should follow their own imagination and not copy anything. Nature too was not to be uh, imi imitated literally, but translated into a language of its own. This corresponded exactly to the approach that Franz uh, Gisek had taught in his uh, ornamental theory classes at the School of Applied Arts, classes Felice had attended during her studies. So she, uh, so she transferred key aspects of his teaching to her own teaching. Again and again, Felice Rix traveled to Europe, met Josef Hoffmann and her Wiener Werkstätte colleagues, such as Fritzi Löw uh, in Vienna or Maria Lickertz in Rome. She visited uh, the United States only once when she went to San Francisco in 1940 on behalf of an exp experimental dyeing plant. She never got to New York. However, the design for a Wiener Werkstätte poster or advertisement has survived, which was created before the MoMA exhibition and has always puzzled me. The sketch shows the Kärntnerstraße and the two uh, Wiener Werkstätte stores of number 32 and 41 are prominently marked. They show several floors which did not correspond to reality and seem to be housed in a high-rise building. The appearance of the street view is more likely of the Fifth Avenue and Central Park in New York than Kärntnerstraße leading to Stephansplatz. In fact, there was a, a, once a Wiener Werkstätte branch on Fifth Avenue in 1922-23. With her great imagination, Felix Rix managed to connect very different stories and places here as well, <clears throat> Pardon. making the transatlantic exchange a picture in a small advertisement. I thank you so much for your interest and attention, and I'm looking forward to your feedback and your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this wonderful pub uh, publication. I hope it's going to be a publication presentation. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm sure there's going to be many questions, um, and it's really nice that we can rather than maybe only looking at Austrian American exchanges also address this idea of the global. Um, so the floor is open. It's overwhelming, <laughs> two lectures on one evening. Yes, please. Hi. Um, both wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I, I know a little bit about Chizek, so it's really wonderful to hear um, the, the diaspora. So, so ter terrific. Um, a question for you both, and, um, and I'm sorry, Megan, if I spaced it out, but, um, um, you know, Sveber goes to New York, correct? I mean, that's her, I, I mean, but she, she goes to the United States. Did she, and, and the question is, um, we know that Felice uh, went because she, she went to Japan because she married a Japanese man. And, and I'm just wondering if the, um, you know, diaspora and the ex cultural exchanges are uh, so often due to marriages. <laughs> and um, and it's, a, it's a wonderful um, cultural exchange, of course. Uh, but I was wondering if the motivation um, was uh, one because of, you know, family or uh, was it one that, um, and this is often true with many Viennese, or at least in the past, is that uh, you make your name outside of Vienna, uh, you'll be, you get recognition and then you can come back once you've been recognized overseas. At least that's um, my experience with contemporary 
well, contemporary decades ago, um, uh, Austrians. So I was just wondering if the, um, what the motivation of to go to New York was um, and whether it had anything to do with, you know, intermarriage. And then the other question related to that is um, the impetus for um, monetizing their, their, um, their production. So especially in Svebrook's, um, you know, Megan, maybe it's a whole different question, uh, but, you know, the socioeconomic background of a person, um, you know, if you have a trust fund, you can dabble, but if you are, um, if you need to make money and survive, then you do things in a, in, in a more aggressive and marketing way to make money. So I was just wondering if, um, uh, you might address that. Thank you. And thank you both. Really wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you. So in the case of Steibruch, I mean, there's a number of reasons. Um, one, so one foremost being she did have um, one Jewish grandfather. So obviously that made her she had to uh, suspect, you know, after the Anschluss, um, her husband, a lawyer, um, was, was Aryan. So she technically transferred the school to his name and he lived on um, Indiana. And, you know, you were asking about mo money. So, I mean, she is sending him money every year. Um, so um, a, a number of other factors. Uh, she was, you know, I, I think your question was very on point, you know, they're acclaimed abroad and then, you know, their reputation languished in Vienna. She was very um, sought after as a lecturer uh, from the like, the 1930s onwards and taught um, as a guest lecturer at, you know, a huge laundry list of distinguished schools from Columbia to, you know, long, long list and also taught less sort of special summer camp, um, like teacher courses. Um, uh, so I think um, she was, uh, I know she writes in her later years that she was energized by the new world. And she says, mm -hmm. she, I'm paraphrasing, but she says something to the effect that I've never worked harder than I have. And I feel younger despite my age. Um, she uh, lived between New York and Los Angeles. She sort of had this jet setting life file fl flying back and forth between the American Crayon Company's headquarters in New York. Um, at Rockefeller Center, and then she commissioned these new um, headquarters um, in uh, Los Angeles. So I hope I I, I um I hope I, that mostly uh, answers answers your 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 question. And she was also like I said briefly, she was fascinated by American culture. She you know um, she uh, she in addition to um, being very interested in Mexican folk art and Native American art. Um, there's Pennsylvania German folk art that she writes about. She also had this sort of problematic fascination with African American culture and writes about that and length and and like um, African American servants she sees and also extended her uh, appreciation of, of folk art to like African American material culture, particularly dolls, um, which was one of her interests. Um, so I hope that answers some of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jane, would you also like to respond to the question? Or, yeah, Rebecca has a question. No, it. no, and Katrine, please go ahead. No, I, I think it was a question for, for Megan. <laughs> um, no, please go ahead. Yes, well, um, first of all, thank you both so much. This is really wonderful to see these talks and all the amazing images of the artist's work. Um, so this is actually for both of you kind of following up on, on Wanda's question, which is about their children. So Megan, you, you showed a little picture by, uh, one of Emmy Spybrook's children. How, I, I wondered how old she was at the time that she produced that. And then I also wondered if Felix, Felix Ricks had children as well given their interest in toys and childhood mm. culture? Um, may I answer first? Um, Felis Rix was childless. The, they had no children. And this, this is also um, um, 
as I think that make it different um, to make research uh, for a family as well as for uh, her sisters. Um, Kitty Rix, for instance, there are also um, no relatives anymore and we don't know um, anything about her um, uh, her life after uh, the Wiener Werkstätte. It is said that uh, Kitty Rix moved to California and died there in 1951, but we couldn't find any document um, that uh, um, could prove that. And we are in the middle of our research because we also want, want uh, to make uh, in our exhibition, um, get some information about the family. So we are in the middle of our research uh, also about um, the other uh, family members, um, but um, we didn't find any um, children or uh, grandchildren and yeah, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the image was by her daughter, Nora, or I think I wish she was around seven. Uh, mm -hmm. six when she did that drawing she was a student in the Chizek school so that is telling and I've seen Amit Saibruk sign the guest book at least once I'm not sure it was actually after her daughter's time uh, but that's very interesting because her daughter you know who went to summer camps when she was on these extended lecture tours in the United States does move with her and becomes her collaborator so they publish together on, um, you know, craft and all of, you know, Emmy uh, Zweibuch's interest. Um, it's interesting that she only has one child, whether that's by choice or, you know, I don't know the circumstances around that, but I can say that a few of the other sort of um, artists that I've worked on, that, that one child phenomenon also happened to characterize their life, which was, you know, not as common in the uh, early 20th century. Um, Austria. Yeah, I just to sort of follow up on, on Katrin's um, response there. I, I one of the reasons I asked was specifically because of that of doing research, how difficult it can be if there are no children who have preserved the records or who have a kind of archive or an estate and you are kind of relying on nieces and nephews maybe who might have carried something on um it's it's really difficult and and yeah i've i've noticed that phenomenon too of successful professional women who maybe have no no children or maybe just one child that's really interesting But maybe I think um, Rebecca, maybe uh, the both of them are very successful designers, and and they received a lot of um, public uh, feedback. So I'm not sure if they don't have these requests. Like, um, I assume Megan, you have access to the papers. Where is there a place after they could find more about that group? And Felix Rix, um, I think Anne found a lot in the museum copy, no? in the museum. I mean, where, where were the major source? Where is the archival work? Because they were, they were um, very successful as teachers and as and they had the students. So some may have had the students. We could, like, for example, with Rizzi a student gave a beautiful testimony about her and her experience with hers. So the question is, where is the, the main source of archive? Yes, for Felice Rix, it's actually the Wiener Werkstätte the archive. That's why we have so many um, works from her. Uh, I think about 1,000 or almost 2,000 uh, designs and, and fabric um, uh, patterns. and. That's what uh, she left here, so to say. And then it's um, uh, a huge archive, of course, in, in Kyoto at uh, the Museum of Modern Art Kyoto, the MoMAC, um, which was the source for their exhibitions. And there's a lot of information we don't have and uh, which is not um, um, uh, bekannt. <laughs> it's not um, known here. Yeah. 
So I think we can uh, offer with, with our exhibition a lot of more ex uh, information, not only our uh, ours from our archives, but also from Japan. Nothing is really known here. And um, um, Felix Rix was not that good documented here in, in, in the uh, in the publications, not so much be uh, as uh, Valley Wieseltier, for instance. Wieseltier um, uh, wrote by herself her articles about her art and and her methods and and her uh, workshop and so on. Um, but Felix Rix uh, seemed to be uh, have been a uh, 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 calm and uh, humble and um, yeah <laughs> person. Um, uh, but I think, and I'm convinced that uh, she knew what she wanted, uh, but it was not that um, um, public, not a public person, yeah? She was an artist and um, yeah, that's why the documentation is, um, is so little, um, the publication about her work is so little. Yeah? May I just follow up on that? Because I think it's like really critical to women's cultural production, not just now, but in, in you know, historically, and why this project that you're doing is, is so, in, all of you collectively are doing is so important. And the way Megan ended her uh, piece with, you know, let's, let's change these hierarchies and change the narrative and, and look you know, with fresh eyes to material and the objects. Um, in a previous life, I was um, an executive director of uh, a foundation based in New York that looked at women, um, that looks at and uh, the, the contributions of women to architecture and the built environment. And the whole premise, um, at least initially, was exactly that, that women architects, and we can say the same for art, any woman involved in any cultural production has de-minimized her production and probably thinks, oh, just put it in the box in the attic or whatever. How many li you know, artistic lives have been lost because of that? And, be and whether they had children or not, even the children threw the stuff out. And we, I, I can tell you many stories. It's, it's not that relevant right now, but um, it's an attitude. It's not just you as historians and looking at, you know, rewriting the narratives, but it's also the women themselves valuing what they're doing and archiving it and, and taking it seriously, finding a location for it. So I think that um, it's wonderful uh, to see the activity around, um, you know, historical women and uh, completely understand the um, difficulty in getting access to that, um, uh, you know, um, archival work. And as you just uh, mentioned, Anna Katrina, um, you know, women who do not promote themselves. I, I know a friend right now who's a terrific artist, and another friend is like pounding her promote yourself, promote yourself, you know, you tell the world who you are and what you're doing. And I think that that's another problem is that women mm -hmm. either just as their emotional makeup or also social, uh, cultural, you know, pressures have cons constructed around them, have told them that, you know, you're not supposed to promote yourself. As you, as you said, she was an artist, she wasn't a promoter. And I think that there's got to be some sort of um, uh, going forward. I would like to see um, women take a, a more balanced, you know, like, um, combine the, the ego-driven, um, you know, me, 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 that, that so many men <laughs> seem mm -hmm. to innately have. Uh, so maybe in your own work that um, you can, uh, in your teachings, um, uh, encourage women to be just as self-conscious and um, self-promoting. And I don't mean that in a neck, you know, I don't mean it in an obnoxious way, but to really um, value, self-value their, their own work. Mm. Anyway, sorry, I just, I just needed, you know, it's, it's um, even the whole thing on Wikipedia, um, days of um, getting women architects and, and women artists into Wikipedia, you know, it's just, we, we got to work extra hard to, to get that presence 
out there. So this is important. Thank you what you're doing. I think I think that's such an important comment. I love that comment. I want to congratulate um, Anne Catherine on this fantastic paper because you know many of us here, um, Alana as well, has also worked on Vizodia, and you know exactly she was a, ma a master of self promotion. She was no stranger to that. And like Rix, I mean this amazing artist with these amazing mm -hmm. influence. I mean, so thank you. That I think this paper was so important. Uh, I was just going to briefly address Alana's question on the sources. So, um, Amy Zweibrick is well documented because she published extensively herself, you know, so you can get all of those secondary sources. But the archival sources are mainly um, the Angewandte archives has a plethora of, of photos of, you know, the her collection, her school, all of the paperwork for her school, you know, some dry material. And also the Belvedere Research Center has an extensive collection of um, primary source clippings, also uh, photos. Um, um, the Met Watson Library has a complete run of the journal she edited, Everyday Art. So I've certainly spent time with those. And as a fun tidbit, it just so happens that their run of Everyday Art were, were the set that belonged to uh, Victor Lohenfeld at um, Penn State. So that was, I like to chuckle when I see that. Um, I think Elana, you, I'll, I'll unmute you. So I have one question to Anne. I mean, also to Megan. Um, it's, it's amazing actually how um, the research um, is somehow with all her modesty, she really um, established the kind of a very distinct um, language that is between uh, figurative and abstract, that she, she brilliantly manages this um, combination of, of abstractions or even geometric abstractions and visual reference to the vegetation. I mean, it's definitely her stamp as an artist. What do you think? Did she have it at her own, um, uh, developed her own aesthetic language? Of, yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, but, but, but <laughs> yeah, you, you would, you would, now, this is something, uh, yeah, and, and you showed it beautifully also, but um, would you like um, say in regard to her um, creativity or authorship as an artist that she really worked on a Felix Riggs um, personal stamp that somehow went throughout her career from Vienna to Tokyo? Tokyo. Like, yeah. Did she somehow develop a kind of a, a, a formal language where people say, this is very sweet, so you can't confuse it with another Mosse, Paula Mosse, the influences on her, Joseph Hoffman, you can't confuse it with other um, um, formal aesthetic languages, even in Kyoto. I mean, she reworks the Wiener Virtue, like Jacqueline Grog in London. Yeah. I mean, this is fairly sweet that you can't, you can't mix it. You see it and you can we construct kind of a formal aesthetic language. Yes, that's what I found that interesting. She is perhaps the only women artist of the Wiener Werkstätte producing such an, an individual style, I think. You, you you can recognize also Mathilde Flügel sometimes, but it's difficult um, with uh, Maria Lickers, for instance, she's a wonderful artist, uh, was a wonderful artist, but um, she she did not develop such an own language. I think the, yeah. she was very flexible uh, and very good in this flexibility. But um, um, yeah, what amazed me is that Rix uh, had her language from from this from the beginning yeah, just from the beginning i mean she was influenced also but i didn't mention by um dagobert pecher yeah. yeah um 
which was that all of the uh, women artists were influenced by Peche uh, in the early years um, when the Künstlerwerkstätte was founded in 1916. But um, she established her, her own style uh, very fast <laughs> so, and developed it. But yeah, she uh, was it true was to herself, like, a, like I uh, wanted to explain. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, the war declarations are fabulous, amazing, amazing. And, and progressive, and if you think about it, it's in the mid century, the mid century, where of the bar. Mm. Yeah. Background. It's it's fascinating. It's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. But the same goes to Zweigel. What do you think? Because she was um, stylistically really, really well. Consider her, or was she like working according to assignments, like commissions that she was working for? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I was thinking about that. I was like, as I was listening to. Uh, and answer. I, I think generally speaking, her earlier work um, in Vienna, you know, after she's a student is is closer to the European folk art. I mean, her, this, you know, I, I threw out that quote from the curator, the hot blooded Slavic embroidery. So I would say generally speaking that, you know, she her work was inflected by folk art and children's drawings. And um, the earlier work is is closer to those European folk art roots. And um, after her emigration, I would say she's increasingly more restrained and streamlined in her design language and, you know, a huge dose of mid-century modernism, but still she always gravitates towards the whimsical, the cute, the naive, um, and, you know, the influence of those Native American, Mexican sources, um, the African-American material culture as well. Um, that's what I would say. Do we have any more questions? Um, if not, then I might use my privilege, <laughs> maybe for the final one, um, which is, I, I, I was, actually I had many different questions, but now I've settled on one, um, which, um, so for, in both talks, we mostly talked about, indi or you mostly talked about individuals, um, so I was wondering what the role of collaboration, um, was in their work. Um, and the first thing that got me thinking about this, um, is, uh, when you, Megan mentioned, uh, that, uh, Zweibrück commissioned Richard Neutra. Um, so I was wondering if maybe collaboration was specifically within emigre networks. Um, and with Rix, of course, there's this collaboration with her husband, which is very clear. But then I also wondered maybe if there was more with her sister or if there were other forms of collaboration after she emigrated to Japan. Yes, um, there was a lot of collaboration in the Künstlerwerkstätte, in the Wiener Werkstätte, of course. Um, um, it was a women network and uh, Rix um, collaborated with um, Mathilde Flögel an um, exhibition design for one of the exhibitions of the um, uh, Frauenkunst, uh, the organization. And also, I think, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's right, with Liane Zimbler, maybe there was also a project, but I'm not sure yet. And in Japan, there was a collaboration with um, Bruno Taut. It's interesting. He um, was invited to Japan to make some research there on Japanese design. And uh, he met Isaburo and Felice uh, Rixueno and they worked together. And obviously there were problems between them um, because he was a modernist and, and she defends the, um, the ideas of the Wiener Werkstätte in terms of um, the decoration of um, objects and um, this was uh, yeah, <laughs> a problem between them, a discussion between them and um, yeah, so it, it was a collaboration in, in a very special way, so to say, <laughs> yeah, or a discussion more, yeah. 
So. I think that's a great question and one that's grounded in, you know, the reality of interwar Vienna and the Künstlerische, uh, the Künstlerwerkstätte, where, you know, you have these less hierarchical modes of creation and sharing collaboration. So absolutely, um, she collaborated with the Wiener Frauenkunst. She was um, a member of that. She was an associate of Simpler and would have known her in exile. I mean, you can look at her collaborators, the fact that she's influenced by the um, aesthetics of children's uh, of children's uh, drawings and thought of this, her work in terms of collaboration, would love to do more with this, but um, she was um, a close associate of uh, the Eameses and, you know, you see their work promoted like all the time in everyday art. Um, so I, I would love to, you know, think further about this notion of collaboration of obviously her daughter, that, that personal and professional relationship um, as well. Thank you so much. Um, if there are, are there any more questions? I'll give you another minute or two. <laughs> um, I always have lots of questions, but, <laughs> but I, I have to go to another meeting, but I just wanted to say thank you both. These were such wonderful talks and it's really about, about how we can do our research. Thank you. Thank you for the nice comment, Rebecca. And of course, yeah. first of all, thanks to our speakers, but I think it's also really nice to see how um, the the discussions really become a sort of, um, not a sort of, how can I say this? Not this answer, a question answer, but it's really a nice conversation and it's really beautiful to keep this going. Um, so I'll also use this opportunity um, to invite you to the talks next week, uh, which will, uh, take place on Thursday again, and we will send you out a reminder with the right uh, registration and timing um, the day before. So thank you everyone for joining um, and see you next week, hopefully.